Hello everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to do part two of aerobic respiration. We're going to do the Krebs cycle and the electron transport systems. Quick review, this should be familiar, but in photosynthesis we are going to be going in one direction and in respiration we're going to be going almost exactly in the opposite direction. So instead of going from ATP to glucose in respiration, we're actually going from glucose to ATP. Most of respiration happens in the mitochondria, although not all. There are two major types of respiration, aerobic and anaerobic, and they depend on whether or not there is oxygen present in the environment. Both types of respiration begin with glycolysis in the cytoplasm of a cell, and then, depending on whether there is oxygen present, you either can go into anaerobic or aerobic respiration. Yeast is what we call a facultative anaerobe. It has the ability to alternate back and forth between aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration depending on the conditions that it's in. This means that yeast can still respirate regardless of whether or not there is oxygen present. However, don't forget that aerobic respiration is much more efficient at generating ATP. It can generate approximately 38 ATP depending on conditions, whereas anaerobic respiration can only generate the 2 ATP it makes during glycolysis. In glycolysis, you'll remember that we started with one molecule of glucose, two molecules of ATP, and two molecules of a molecule called NAD+. After glycolysis, which requires a boost of energy from ATP, we generate four molecules of ATP, two molecules of pyruvate, and two molecules of NADH. Remember, whenever you see any of these molecules in their green battery form, this means that they are in the energy-rich form. Before we can move on to the Krebs cycle, which occurs in the mitochondria, we have to rearrange the pyruvate as well as something called coenzyme A and two more molecules of NAD+. After this rearranging occurs, we create two molecules of acetyl coenzyme A, also known as acetyl-CoA, two molecules of carbon dioxide, and two molecules of NADH. So at the end of these first two steps, glycolysis and the PrEP steps, we've created two molecules of ATP, four molecules of NADH, and zero molecules of this other thing called FADH2, which we'll see in a little bit. At this point, the process will move out of the cytoplasm of the cell and into the mitochondria. Now we're going to move into the third step of aerobic respiration, which is called the Krebs cycle. For every molecule of glucose invested, the Krebs cycle will turn twice. This is why there's a times two in the middle. As we go through the Krebs cycle, you may notice some things that are similar to the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis. For instance, that we reinvest certain parts of the cycle in order to keep it going. Remember that in the prep steps, we made something called acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is going to become the first part of our chain. Here is what mitochondria look like in cross-section. Remember that mitochondria are organelles that live inside of cells. Similar to the chloroplasts that power photosynthesis, mitochondria have different compartments. They have an outer membrane around the outside and an inner membrane on the inside. The innermost area of the mitochondria, where the Krebs cycle occurs, is called the matrix. The area in between the inner and outer membranes is called the cristae. All along the border of the inner membrane between the matrix and the cristae are the electron transport chains. Be sure to keep this diagram in mind as we go through the, the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. Acetyl-CoA is going to enter the Krebs cycle. Remember that it has two carbons. This next step is going to be a little bit tricky, so we're going to try to go through it step by step. If we were to look ahead several steps in the Krebs cycle, so not here, not here, not here, but here, we're going to discover a compound called oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate is created after many steps in the Krebs cycle. You should note that oxaloacetate also has four carbons. Oxaloacetate will then combine with the molecule of acetyl-CoA that we made during the PrEP steps. This combination is going to form an intermediate molecule, 
Based on what you know about acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate, try to guess how many carbons will be in the intermediate. So hopefully you figured out that since oxaloacetate has four carbons and acetyl-CoA has two carbons, that this intermediate will have six carbons. We're now going to begin breaking apart the number six intermediate. We're going to pull off some carbons and do a bunch of other things to it to ultimately turn it into oxaloacetate with four carbons. Just like in photosynthesis, we're going to keep track of our carbons for the entire cycle. Because this intermediate has six carbons, we're going to call it intermediate with a six in front of it, like this. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to rip off one of the carbons in the form of carbon dioxide. We've already generated some CO2 during the prep steps, but this is where more of the CO2 is going to come from. Because we've now lost a carbon, we now know how many carbons our next intermediate will have. As you've probably guessed, the next intermediate in the chain will only have five carbons because we lost this carbon right here. We aren't done yet, however. In the process of breaking apart the number six intermediate to release carbon dioxide, we also have the spare energy and electrons to recharge a molecule of NAD plus into NADH. Remember that NAD plus doesn't have very much potential energy, but NADH does, and we're going to use it later on. So right now we have a five carbon intermediate, and we need to make it into four carbon oxaloacetate. So you can probably guess one of the steps that needs to happen in between. If you guess that we're going to remove another carbon and make more carbon dioxide, you're right. Here is where more of the carbon dioxide made during respiration comes from. We're also going to repeat the same reaction that we saw earlier. Just like we did earlier, we're going to use the energy released from breaking open the 5-carbon intermediate to recharge NAD plus into NADH. We now have a 4-carbon intermediate, which is almost like oxaloacetate, but we still need to go through a couple of more reactions to turn this molecule into this molecule. In order to convert our 4-carbon intermediate into oxaloacetate, we have to undergo a series of very complex reactions that are going to generate three different products. The first reaction will result in a molecule of ADP being recharged into ATP. While we may refer to this as recharging, the scientific term for the changing of ADP into ATP is phosphorylation. The next reaction that occurs is the recharging of FAD into FADH2. Finally, we will also be creating one more molecule of NADH from NAD+. After we have done all three of those reactions in that order, we now have this new molecule of oxaloacetate, which can then combine with acetyl-CoA and restart the cycle all over again. Now let's check out our scorecard from the Krebs cycle. After the prep steps, we had 2 ATP, 4 NADH, and 0 FADH2. This is going to be updated to reflect what we created during the Krebs cycle. Count how many of each type of molecule we create during a rotation of the Krebs cycle. Don't forget that for every molecule of glucose, this entire cycle happens twice. We've made two new molecules of ATP during the Krebs cycle, one per rotation. We also made six molecules of NADH, three per rotation. And finally, we made one new FADH2 molecule per turn of the Krebs cycle for a total of two. So now let's update our scorecard. So now we've made 4 ATP, 10 NADH, and 2 FADH2. Remember that our goal is to make ATP, and so, so far, aerobic respiration isn't proving very much more efficient than anaerobic respiration. But we're going to cash in all of these types of molecules in order to generate lots of ATP during the electron transport chain. We're now going to show you how this rest of this process works in the context of the mitochondria. Remember that the Krebs cycle took place inside the matrix of the mitochondrion, whereas the electron transport chain is located on the inner membrane. Now we're going to see what all that NADH and FADH2 is doing.
NADH and FADH2 will move high energy electrons over to the electron transport chain. This piece of the electron transport chain should look very familiar from your work on photosynthesis. This is the proton pump. The electrons from NADH and FADH2 will energize the proton pump to begin working. There are many protons inside the matrix of the mitochondria. Once the proton pump is activated by the high energy electrons coming from NADH and FADH2, the protons begin to move through the proton pump and into the cristae. This continues to happen until there are more of the protons outside the matrix than there are inside. Okay, so now all of my protons have gone through the proton pump and are now in the area in between the matrix and the outside of the mitochondria. We call this the cristae, but some textbooks call this the intermembrane space. Because there are now more protons on the outside than there are on the inside, this creates an electrochemical gradient. All of the protons really want to get back into the matrix. They want to flow down the concentration gradient. Well, luckily for them, there's a way for them to do that. Think back to your work in photosynthesis. How was it that the protons went down the electrical chemical gradient? If you remember that the protons flow through an ATP synthase protein, you're right on the money. The protons that are now on the outside of the matrix will flow back in via the ATP synthase. When the protons flow through, they generate ATP and a lot of it. Exactly how much ATP is produced depends on the amount of NADH and FADH2 that we produced in the Krebs cycle and in glycolysis. Let's look back at these two molecules for a minute. Both NADH and FADH2 provide power to the proton pump, and the amount of power provided by NADH and FADH2 is exactly enough to produce a certain number of ATP molecules. One molecule of NADH produces just enough juice in order to make three ATP. One molecule of FADH2 produces just enough juice to make two ATP. When you have 10 NADH worth of juice and two FADH2 worth of juice adding together to power the proton pump, you can generate a lot of ATP very quickly. So now time for some math. If one NADH molecule can produce three ATP, and one FADH2 molecule can produce two ATP, how many ATP does the electron transport chain generate in total? Here we can see what happens if you have the normal 10 NADHs and the normal two FADH2s. You generate 30 ATP from the NADH and then another four from the FADH2 for a total of 34 ATP. This is why we always say that the electron transport chain is the real money maker when it comes to making ATP in respiration. NADH and FADH2 don't stop there, however. After their electrons have powered the proton pump, they join up with a proton and with an oxygen molecule in order to form water. This is why we often say that the oxygen is the terminal electron acceptor in, in respiration. After the NADH and FADH2 have done their duty by donating the electrons, they're going to be converted back into the low energy forms of NAD plus and FAD. The FAD molecules will then be recharged during the Krebs cycle. And the NAD plus will be recharged during the Krebs cycle as well as during glycolysis. So, to recap the electron transport chain, Inside the matrix of the mitochondria, the NADH and FADH2 from the Krebs cycle donate high energy electrons to power a proton pump. The proton pump sucks protons out of the matrix and into the space in between the two mitochondrial membranes, creating an electrochemical gradient. The protons flow down this gradient by going through the ATP synthase, generating molecules of ATP. Each molecule of NADH gives just enough juice to the proton pump to eventually produce three molecules of ATP, while FADH is a little bit lower energy and it can only produce two per molecule.
The electrons ultimately combine with protons and oxygen in order to form water as a byproduct. Once the NADH and FADH2 are finished, they go back to be recharged in the form of NAD plus and FAD. Then the cycle can begin all over again. So let's update our scorecard one last time. After the electron transport chain, we generate an extra 34 ATP thanks to NADH and FADH2. This means that in total, aerobic respiration can produce approximately 38 ATP during ideal conditions.